Section 8 of The New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section 8. It might be here objected unto me, and even by one worthy of controversy, that I have spoken of love as though it were a thing outward and visible, not only a spiritual essence, but as a bodily substance also. The which thing, in absolute truth, is a fallacy, love not being of itself a substance, but an accident of substance. Yet, that I speak of love as though it were a thing tangible and even human, appears by three things which I say thereof. And firstly, I say that I perceived love coming towards me, whereby, seeing that to come bespeaks locomotion, and seeing how philosophy teacheth us that none but a corporeal substance hath locomotion, it seemeth that I speak of love as a corporeal substance. And secondly, I say that love smiled, and thirdly, that love spake, faculties, and especially the risable faculty, which appear proper unto man, whereby it further seemeth that I speak of love as of a man. Now that this matter may be explained, as is fitting, it must first be remembered that anciently they who wrote poems of love wrote not in the vulgar tongue, but rather certain poets in the Latin tongue. I mean, among us, although perchance the same may have been among others, and although likewise, as among the Greeks, they were not writers of spoken language, but men of letters, treated of these things. And indeed, it is not a great number of years since poetry began to be made in the vulgar tongue, the writing of rhymes in spoken language corresponding to the writing in metre of Latin verse by a certain analogy. And I say that it is but a little while, because if we examine the language of Oco and the language of Si, we shall not find in those tongues any written thing of an earlier date than the last hundred and fifty years. Also, the reason why certain of a very mean sort obtained at first some fame as poets is that before them no man had written verses in the language of C. And of these, the first was moved to the writing of such verses by the wish to make himself understood of a certain lady unto whom Latin poetry was difficult. This thing is against such as rhyme concerning other matters than love, that mode of speech having been first used for the expression of love alone. Wherefore, seeing that poets have a license allowed them, that is not allowed unto the writers of prose, and seeing also that they who write in rhyme are simply poets in the vulgar tongue, it becomes fitting and reasonable that a larger license should be given to these than to other modern writers, and that any metaphor or rhetorical similitude which is permitted unto poets should also be counted not unseemly in the rhymers of the vulgar tongue. Thus, if we perceive that the former have caused inanimate things to speak as though they had sense and reason, and to discourse one with another, yea, and not only actual things, but such also as have no real existence, seeing that they have made things which are not to speak, and oftentimes written of those which are merely accidents as though they were substances and things human. It should therefore be permitted to the latter to do the like, which is to say, not inconsiderately, but with such sufficient motive as may afterwards be set forth in prose. That the Latin poets have done thus appears through Virgil, where he saith that Juno, to wit, a goddess hostile to the Trojans, spake unto Aeolus, master of the winds, as it is written in the first book of the Aeneid, Aeole nam qui tibi, etc., and that this master of the winds made reply, Tus, o regina, quid optes, explorare labor, mihi iusa capesere fas est. And through the same poet the inanimate thing speaketh unto the animate, in the third book of the Aeneid, where it is written, Dardani de duri, etc. With Lucan the animate thing speaketh to the inanimate, as thus, Multum Roma tamen debis civilibus armis. In Horace man is made to speak to his own intelligence as unto another person, and not only hath Horace done this, but herein he followeth the excellent Homer, as thus in his poetics, Dic mihi musa virum, etc. Through Ovid love spaketh as a human creature, in the beginning of his discourse, De remedis amoris, as thus, Bella mihi, video, bella parantur ait, by which in samples this thing shall be made manifest unto such as may be offended at any part of this my book. And, lest some of the common sort should be moved to jeering hereat, I will here add that neither did these ancient poets speak thus without consideration, nor should they who are masters of rhyme in our day write after the same fashion, having no reason in what they write. For it were a shameful thing if one should rhyme under the semblance of metaphor or rhetorical similitude, and afterwards, being questioned thereof, should be unable to rid his words of such semblance unto their right understanding, of whom, to wit, of such as rhyme thus foolishly, myself and the first among my friends do know many. But, returning to the matter of my discourse, this excellent lady of whom I spake and what hath gone before, 
came at last into such favor with all men that when she passed anywhere folk ran to behold her, which thing was a deep joy to me, and when she drew near unto any, so much truth and simpleness entered into his heart that he dared neither to lift his eyes nor to return her salutation, and unto this many who have felt it can bear witness. She went along crowned and clothed with humility, showing no wit of pride in all that she heard and saw, and when she had gone it was said of many, This is not a woman, but one of the beautiful angels of heaven. And there were some that said, This is surely a miracle. Blessed be the Lord, who hath power to work thus marvellously. I say, of very sooth, that she showed herself so gentle and so full of all perfection, that she bred in those who looked upon her a soothing quiet beyond any speech, neither could any look upon her without sighing immediately. These things, and things yet more wonderful, were brought to pass through her miraculous virtue, wherefore I, considering thereof and wishing to resume the endless tale of her praises, resolved to write somewhat wherein I might dwell on her surpassing influence to the end that not only they who had beheld her, but also others, might know as much concerning her as words could give to the understanding. And it was then that I wrote this sonnet. My lady looks so gentle and so pure when yielding salutation by the way, that the tongue trembles and has naught to say, and the eyes which fain would see may not endure. And still amid the praise she hears secure, she walks with humbleness for her array, seeming a creature sent from heaven to stay on earth and show a miracle made sure. She is so pleasant in the eyes of men, that through the sight the inmost heart doth gain, a sweetness which needs proof to know it by, and from between her lips there seems to move a soothing essence that is full of love, saying forever to the spirit, Sigh. This sonnet is so easy to understand from what is afore narrated that it needs no division, and therefore leaving it I say also that this excellent lady came into such favor with all men, that not only she herself was honored and commended, but through her companionship honor and commendation came unto others. Wherefore I, perceiving this, and wishing that it should also be made manifest to those that beheld it not, wrote the sonnet here following, wherein is signified the power which her virtue had upon other ladies. For certain he hath seen all perfectness, who among other ladies hath seen mine. They that go with her humbly should combine to thank their God for such peculiar grace, so perfect is the beauty of her face, that it begets in no wise any sign of envy, but draws round her a clear line of love and blessed faith and gentleness. Merely the sight of her makes all things bow. Not she herself alone is holier than all, but hers through her are raised above. From all her acts such lovely graces flow, that truly one may never think of her without a passion of exceeding love. This sonnet has three parts. In the first, I say in what company this lady appeared most wondrous. In the second, I say how gracious was her society. In the third, I tell of the things which she, with power, worked upon others. The second begins here, they that go with her. The third here, so perfect. This last part divides into three. In the first, I tell what she operated upon women, that is, by their own faculties. In the second, I tell what she operated in them, through others. In the third, I say how she not only operated in women, but in all people and not only while herself present, but by memory of her operated wondrously. The second begins here, merely the sight, the third here, from all her acts. Thereafter, on a day, I began to consider that which I had said of my lady, to wit in these two sonnets of foregone, and, becoming aware that I had not spoken of her immediate effect on me at that especial time, it seemed to me that I had spoken effectively, whereupon I resolved to write somewhat of the manner wherein I was then subjected to her influence, and of what her influence then was. In conceiving that I should not be able to say these things in the small compass of a sonnet, I began therefore a poem with this beginning. Love hath so long possessed me for his own, and made his lordship so familiar, that he who at first irked me is now grown unto my heart as its best secrets are. And thus, when he in such sore wise doth mar my life, that all its strength seem gone from it, Mine inmost being then feels thoroughly quit of anguish, and all evil keeps afar. Love also gathers to such power in me, that my sighs speak each one a grievous thing, always soliciting my lady's salutation piteously, whenever she beholds me it is so, who is more sweet than any words can show. End of section 8